we've moved into the review of the precepts. And this week, revisiting a little bit the first one, non-harm, non-killing, ahimsa. And, you know, as we engage in this process of looking at how we act in the world, what's ethical, what feels right. I know for me, sometimes I can really get caught in my head, in my mind, really looking for a map of like, what should I do? Am I a good person? Was I a good person? (laughs) What's right in this situation? And even when we have the map and the guidelines of the precepts, my sense is that we can kind of quickly collapse into tightness into a fear about getting it right or doing it right. And in that we can wind up turning away from really slowing down and listening into where we are and what might be needed in a given moment or situation. Lori spoke about Hiri and Otapa on Monday. Hiri, the importance of that listening in, right? Recognizing when something we did really doesn't feel right. And otapa, the kind of anticipatory awareness, like, oh, if I do this, I know this isn't going to quite feel good. And how both are really important and instructive in our path, what she called honesty with ourselves, honesty with ourselves. And I wanted to expand and build on that some. I was really struck by something that the meditation teacher, Jesse Masio Vega Frey said in a recent retreat. He said, the practice is just watching the opening and closing of the heart. The practice is just watching the opening and closing of the heart. And it felt like such a relief to me to hear that. Just the acknowledgement that these hearts do open and they do close and that I can be with that process. He didn't say this practice is about making sure our heart is open and stays open all the time, (laughs) right? But that we notice and are with that process of open, close. And with Sila, as we take action in the world, do we check, do we check? Ah, what am I actually up for? What's happening here as I get ready to take action out there? What Jesse said also reminded me of Achan Cha, the well-known Thai forest monk and his emphasis on the heart. Many Western teachers who studied with him have mentioned that he would often say, the only book worth reading is the book of the heart. He said, Dharma is in your heart. Don't believe others, just listen to your heart. You don't have to go and look anywhere else. Wisdom is in you, just like the sweet ripe mango is already in the young green one. Do we trust that? Do we trust that, that the Dharma is all right here if we listen? And that wisdom is in us, has the potential to grow within us. And are we listening to the heart, mind, and body? Do you trust that these hearts, this heart will open gradually if you allow it to do so in its own time and at its own pace? And if we allow our hearts to close when they need to? Because it's really impossible for our hearts to act for the benefit and well being of others if we're really caught or closed in fear or anger or doubt. But I think the teachers are inviting us to notice that, notice that fear or doubt or anger, and trusting that we can learn from that, that we can feel it not identify with it, not judge it, not turn away, but actually turn toward. 
So what Jesse said, we watch the heart open and close. I, I'm guessing each of you have experience with that, right? Feeling and watching the body, mind, heart tense and tighten. And then it relaxes and opens. And noticing the conditions that bring both, right? We might really feel into the contraction of, I can't. I need to shut this person out. I can't give anymore. I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid. And then we can also feel the expansiveness of moments when it really relaxes and somehow has room for what's here for us, room to care about others unconditionally, has the capacity to just act from that place. I know I have times when that just feels so possible and then times when it's like completely impossible. <laughs> It's just not there. And the teachers are inviting us to notice all of that and honor that natural rhythm, right? We can trust it. It's okay. And I really believe more and more that that is a way of practicing non-harm and ahimsa because we don't want to override where we are. That's not being honest with ourselves or kind of how things are right now. I thought of another quote, a really well-known one by Rumi. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it and embrace them. And embrace them. That last piece feels key. And Tara Brock has really pointed to that. So we're again just hearing like it's all right here. If we listen in and embrace the fear, the doubt, the little me, the petty parts of me. As Susan would say, can we love it all into the fold of mindfulness? Because it is actually all our teacher and that source of wisdom that Achan Cha talked about. For me, I'm really learning to include myself as part of this first precept. That feels like what I'm most listening to uh, and hearing in my system and in my heart. And I wanted to just give a few examples of that. One is that I was on a short retreat with Jesse and with Michelle McDonald, and they kept encouraging everyone to slow down and back off. And it took a while to really hear that and have that sink in. Usually when I'm in retreat, I like, I do it all. I'm sitting, I'm walking, I'm not reading anything, I'm not writing anything, I'm not speaking, right? There's a part of me that really likes to adhere to the rules, this sort of monastic part of me. And they were noticing that a lot of us were actually quite exhausted, having a lot of emotions kind of move through. And they wanted us to practice in a way that included taking care of ourselves and listening to that. And so one of the ways that I did give myself a break was for the first few nights, I let myself read a fantasy book, right? Sounds super small. And it's actually like not doing the thing that I'm supposed to, supposed to be doing, right? But I listened inside. And what I heard was I really needed a break from being eyeball to eyeball with myself in practice. Right? It was too much of a shift to go from life into a retreat like that. I needed to ease in. And giving myself that, that little kindness, really allowed me to stay in the retreat and allowed my system and my heart to trust me. One other example, two other examples, actually. Um, I sign up for a lot of uh, these trainings, these trainings around the therapy that uh, that I use uh, and I sign up to be on staff I really love it it's very experiential but it's also quite exhausting and I had put my name in the ring to be on staff for one in November and that night I woke up in the middle of the night to a very familiar kind of tugging overwhelm and panic this part of me that I sort of learned to listen to, this alarm that was saying, it, it's gonna be too much. You're setting yourself up to be exhausted and depleted and overwhelmed. 
and not present for the people in your life. And we know that doesn't feel good. And even though it's a pretty panicky voice, it's one that has wisdom and knows something about me and about what I often try to ignore, which is my limits. So I took my name out of the running. And again, right, this sounds like a very small decision, but it brought a lot of relief and honored what I was hearing inside, honored what this system needed and what my capacity was and wasn't. One other tiny example that was definitely for myself, but also included other beings. I jog in the woods a lot and I love it, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, but it's the summer and there's a lot of bugs and it feels almost every time like the one fly in the forest has found me and is following me the entire time. And there's mosquitoes and gnats and they're landing on my face. And I am not at the point yet where I don't automatically try to smash them and smush them and get them away from me. And even I hear myself, I've been laughing, I hear myself saying to them, how rude, like, will you stop? You know, as if, as if like they're doing, I'm, I'm totally invading their habitat, right? <laughs> um, so small step that I took, I got a mosquito netting that goes over my head. I look really silly, but when it gets kind of bad and I'm getting overwhelmed by it, I pull it down and the bugs are out here. They're not touching me. And I protect myself from the bad feeling and the karma of killing them because I'm, I'm not in a place where I won't. I protect them from being killed. <laughs> and I get to kind of build a relationship with them. Let my heart just begin when they're not on me to begin to build a different relationship with them. Right. And so if you were in any of these situations, you might do something different. And that's also what's tough about this, right? We each have to bear the consequences of our actions. We each have to decide what's right for us in any given moment. And the Dharma, the precepts, they're great guidelines, but none of it is robotic or automatic. They're alive and always new here and now. Each situation really worthy of investigation and understanding. And we are new in every situation that we choose to act in. And so can we do that? Can we listen and read the book of the heart? Watch the opening and closing, hear what's being communicated here? Can we honor a closed heart? Recognize that all beings close. We're not alone, right? And when we open a bit, ah, all beings have that capacity too. So may we remember that the Dharma is in our hearts. We can listen. May we feel the goodness of listening to that feel the goodness of caring for ourselves and feel the goodness of caring for others. All of it, an opportunity to deepen our wisdom and our compassion. So thank you for listening. <laughs>